Today we're going to be hearing about when free speech is actually its opposite. So, from Dr. Sean McFessel. He is a faculty member of the English department at Highland College. He received his PhD in language and rhetoric at the University of Washington in 2014 and a master's in teaching in English to speakers of other languages in 2010. He has published two books, Nonviolence Ain't What It Used To Be, Unarmed Insurrection and the Rhetoric of Resistance, and Suffolk How It Gush, A North American Anarchist in the Balkans. McFessel has authored a, num a number of academic and popular articles and has appeared as the social movement scholar on radio and TV. He is, has been involved in social movements and protests for the last 30 years in the U.S., Eastern Europe, and the Middle East. Um, so, without further ado, Dr. Sean McFessel. Thank you so much, Leigh. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that we are in occupied Duwamish land, and we are honored actually on Monday or Tuesday to hear from. Cecile, who's the representative now for the Duwamish, so it was an honor to have her here. Um, I want to start by saying thank you infinitely much to the MLK Week Planning Committee. Um, it's a real honor to come here as a speaker, and um, also to the Multicultural Affairs Office and Intercultural Center and Highline. Woo! Um, um, we really, really appreciate this opportunity. I also wanted another thing I want to say before we get started. This presentation, a lot of it, is about this, um, it's a really ugly phenomenon, and I'm a little worried it's sort of a downer presentation in some ways, to so just sort of be emotionally ready to hear some rough stuff. Um, some of the slides are actually, refer pretty openly to, to um, racist and anti-queer violence. I'm gonna give you a warning when those come up, but just be aware that that's, that's part of this presentation. Um, and also, just because we're focusing, I'm going to be focusing in this talk on kind of white nationalism and a lot of the really explicit, open displays of white supremacy and white nationalism that are happening in our country right now. That's not to say that probably the much more widespread, endemic, systemic white supremacy and racism um, in this country, you know, that's not to not deny the importance and centrality of those. Luckily, we've had a lot of really wonderful speakers already and will continue to, and Highland continues to be an amazing campus for talking about these issues. But I just want to acknowledge, just because we're focusing on the really obvious, nasty, open, explicit kind of racism, is not to deny the importance and the devastating effects of systemic, more uh, not always as open forms of racism. Um, I also want to acknowledge my positionality as a white guy talking about this. It can be sort of paradoxical moments or whatever, but um, so I acknowledge that I'm talking about phenomenon where I'm not the primary target, and sometimes I, you know, I often don't have primary experience about it, but I do think that white people can you know, play a part in fighting these systems and, and have to, just like everyone. Um, and yeah, with that, I'd like to get started. Um, so what I'm gonna be talking about today is this weird phenomenon. There's been a lot of things that have happened to us in the last year as a country, as a world. Um, and of course, all of these things have roots, all of these things have been going on in some way for a long time, but we've really seen some abrupt changes in the way these things have happened um, that I think has caught a lot of us off guard. And I'm really, I'm only talking about one of those. There's many, many things. Um, when we're talking about the, the legacy of MLK and his legacy of resistance and the history of inequality, and racism that he stood up against. Um, there's so many strains we could focus on, so I'm just gonna acknowledge I'm really focusing on one specific phenomenon that's happened over the last year, but maybe especially in the question and answer period, we can kind of work on applying this more widely and connect it to other things. But I think particularly it's something that's been happening on college campuses, even locally, and specifically across the country. So I think um, all of us involved with this college should be concerned about this and should think about what it means for our positions. <clears throat> so a lot of the disagreement and the controversy has revolved around language in the First Amendment of the Constitution, the, the beginning of the Bill of Rights, the most basic important law of our government. And part of that says, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. This is kind of ambiguous. It's a nice idea, right? It's a lot better than having a king who can say you're not allowed to say things or a dictator. But there's some kind of ambiguity in the meaning of that. 
And what I'm going to talk about today is the way that some social forces are kind of playing with that ambiguity to, to put some things over on us and maybe how we don't have to take it. So I don't know how many of you, I'm just curious actually, can you raise your hand if you've heard of this, this guy Richard Spencer? Is up on the screen now? Okay, maybe about half, a third of the room. So Richard Spencer has come to notoriety, especially in the last year, year and a half. He's an open white nationalist. He talks about wanting the United States to be a white ethno state, meaning basically a place only for white people. And he talks about how he believes in peaceful ethnic cleansing. I have no idea what that could possibly mean. I don't think it's displacing, you know, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people from their homes doesn't tend to be a peaceful process. So I don't actually, you know, I think he's lying, but he has this sort of polite demeanor. And he's been having a great deal of success going around and speaking at college campuses. We haven't seen him yet in Seattle, but I mean, he's in public, he's come here, but um, we might soon, we should be prepared. But what I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start uh, with a story about him. I'm gonna show you a few other stories to kind of show you this problem and then we're gonna kind of break down the problem and how we can respond to it. So currently, right now, Richard Spencer has been invited to speak at the University of Michigan um, by like a conservative student group. And the administration says, well, you know, it's free speech. Um, well, let me just, I'm gonna play the video. Some students have, so he's been invited to speak on campus and there's students who, you know, for very good reason, they're saying, let's not let this happen, this is ridiculous. So they're protesting, they're trying to stop it. What I want you to listen for, particularly, of course, what the students are saying, but the, um, one of the administrators of the college comes out to speak to them, the chancellor, and says why he thinks they need to let Richard Spencer come. So pay special attention to the ways that the chancellor responds to the students' concerns in this video. Okay, 
So um, you heard his response that he, he said, because of the law, he said also, because of the current legal environment in this country, which is an interesting phrase that we might come back to, um, and because of the Constitution of the United States, they have to let Richard Spencer speak, is what he said. Um, they don't have a choice. And you know, he said, even though it should go without saying that the university is opposed to things like what Richard Spencer is saying, um, that the University of Michigan has no choice but to let him speak. So um, we're going to get into that. That's what this presentation is about, is sort of how to answer that. One of the things that I just want to notice is there's, it's strange the way that this is applied because he says it goes without knowing, they have no choice, he used these very absolute phrases. Two years ago, the same university, University of Michigan, invited Alice Walker, I think a student group also, invited Alice Walker, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Color Purple, very famous, famous novel, famous film, to come and speak at the University of Michigan, at the same college, and the college disinvited her. They said that she could not speak because they actually sent a letter to her. They said some of the donors of the school did not like what she has said about the state of Israel. She made comments that said that she grew up in the Jim Crow South and when she visited um, Israel and Palestine, she said it re the system there reminded her of growing up in the Jim Crow South. So because she'd been talking about that, the same university with that same chancellor we just heard from said she was not allowed to talk and canceled her talk. So. And currently, that same college, you can look at the headlines. I'm curious how it's going to turn out, but it sounds like they actually are going to allow Richard Spencer to speak. So there's something going on here, and I'm trying to figure out through this talk, you know, kind of what, what, what's this phenomenon and how do we respond. In bearing this out, I, I want to tell you a couple more stories. Um, both of these are actually local and a bit closer to home. Um, University of Washington in Seattle, I live, this is where I got my PhD, and I live just up the street from this. Um, so this hits me very close to home. They were having a performance, um, a student a theater group was having a performance on the theater on the UW campus of a Shakespeare play, As You Like It, and the majority, like all the leads of the cast, the majority of the, of the actors are people of color and, you know, several, and, and they're portraying queer folks, there's several queer folks in it. And as they were in the performance with also a majority people of color audience, um, the, so by the way, this is the first of the flyers that's kind of upsetting coming up, content warning. Um, while they were performing the, this play with a full house, the theater was plastered with these posters from a group called Adam Walking, which has, you can see swastikas on the flyers and it says, Seattle needs a good cleansing, drive out yellow, black and brown, the sodomites and degenerates. So we see explicitly extreme racist language and anti-gay, lesbian, queer language on these flyers. Um, so, you know, and again, this went up while people were in the building, glued all over the outside of the building. So as you can imagine, this is a quote from one of the students. People were very upset. I mean, they felt directly attacked by this, right? And one of the actors in the play, she said, it was terrifying because all the leads are people of color, as were a lot of our audience. We have people playing LGBTQ characters, and that's a huge portion of our audience. It didn't seem arbitrary. She's like, we're being targeted on purpose, right? The thing that upsets me so much is the blatant gaslighting that is happening across the nation. This can't be normalized, yet it is, because we're seeing it so often. And she said out loud, addressing that same language we're hearing so much, this is not freedom of speech. This is harassment. Tamsin Glasser. So, you know. That's, I can very much understand how she would feel this way, right? That seems like a very reasonable response. The response from the University of Washington Police Department was somewhat different. Um, Rittenhauser, I think, was the chief of police. And he came out in the same article, and in regard to those flyers going up, he said this, putting up handbills is certainly legal. We want people to be able to promote freedom of expression and freedom of thought. For some people, those flyers are gonna be clearly offensive. For others, it's going to be seen as not offensive. We are an open campus that respects, here's the words, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, so we will let people judge that in a way they want to. And then this is the winning line. Obviously, if you find it offensive, you'll want to stay away from that, he said. So <laughs> the, the least we can say here is we're seeing a, a fighting of frameworks with participants who said, 
well, this freedom of expression, there's nothing we can do. And people are like, this isn't a freedom of expression. Are you crazy? Another situation even closer to home, um, not physically, but in terms of the institution, Shoreline, I have a lot of colleagues who teach at Shoreline Community College. Um, and there's a lot of great folks there. You know, like it's, it's a really good place. But there's one concerning phenomenon that my colleagues have drawn attention to, that there's been a, a crew of Nazi skinheads that have a long history of violence in the region called the Northwest Hammerskins. They've been present on campus, kind of hanging out. They haven't made a big deal yet. But they're clearly sort of testing the waters to see how people react. And some of the faculty and listservs, when people are talking about how to respond, some of the teachers have sort of been saying, you know, I think they just feel like that because they feel like they're not heard. So maybe we should invite them into our classrooms and make sure they feel heard, and then they won't feel so angry. So to get us going on the topic, um, what I'd like to do now is turn to your neighbor, let's say in groups of maybe three, three or four, two if you're kind of in a smaller group, and uh, introduce yourself, say hi. And I'm just kind of curious to hear a couple ideas. We're not going to have a lot of time, um, but just to kind of get us thinking about these things. In those three stories, Richard Spencer, you know, having to have his freedom of speech at the University of Michigan, the theater flyers being said, well, some people will like it, some people won't. Don't, if you don't like it, don't go near the building that Nazis are pasting pens on. And then the, um, the talking about inviting the, the skinheads into the classroom. Do you think that that was the right, those are the right responses? And you know, why or why not? And do you have ideas of ways that that could have been done differently? So go ahead, turn to your neighbors and talk about that just for a couple minutes. We're going to have a half an hour um, after the lecture to, to have a discussion and, and a back and forth questions and answers, open discussion. So make sure to hold on to some of the thoughts that you just had. And if they're not kind of addressed in this talk, um, let's have those. But I just maybe just to kind of get us going, um, anybody, what was the response? Maybe if somebody could tell me something that their partner said that they hadn't thought of before. Anybody have something to offer that they hadn't thought of that the person they were in a group with? <gasps> <laughs> okay, Alyssa, here we go. <coughs> okay. Well, I think one of the, uh, one of my uh, uh, colleagues or a faculty member said it about, you know, that they would really use different language to um, express their opinion towards the matters that they're using burger language than being able to push a hatred uh, mm -hmm. of doctors. You know, they could have used a different type of language to push their doctor, but instead of they used something that was going to offend each and every single one of, of any individual people. So it's all about how do you use your language at the end of the day. Yeah, that's really, really well put. And that's, that's going to be one of the things we talk about um, later on is that there's content and there's also language, right? There's ideas and there's free exchange of ideas and then there's the way that we choose to, to put those in words. And those could be kind of different things that might really matter when we're talking about freedom of speech. Okay, there's so much to say. Um, I think what I'm gonna ask you is um, hold on to the thoughts that you had and the thoughts that you heard in the conversation. And if we, if we touch on those, great. If there are things that come up that you, that we haven't heard, please um, bring those up in the question and answer period. But I'm really glad I heard some wonderful conversation on the topic. So I'm going to kind of present my case for why we might want to oppose things that call themselves freedom of speech. People probably, some of you are familiar with the idea of scare quotes. So this means just because somebody calls something freedom of speech doesn't mean it is, right? That's why I have the quotations instead of me saying it's something I think is free speech. Um, free speech is one of these things. It's so foundational. I was just hearing from somebody um, from Ethiopia who was saying, you know, it's, it's something they really treasure about the United States because if you speak out against power and the authorities, the president in Ethiopia and a lot of places, you can really get in trouble. You could be killed. You could be imprisoned, right? So it's really important that we have this law in the country to say that you can't do that, right? But what is that? What are the limits of that law? You know, are there are there times that you would want to oppose it, even if people were claiming to be using it? So I'm going to list off a series of kind of five <coughs> problems, five things we might want to think about, and five reasons we might want to object, even if somebody's saying, "Well, don't you like freedom of speech? Are you against freedom of speech?" Then you have to let me talk. Not necessarily. The first one is inconsistency. We just heard about the Alice Walker Richard Spencer 
example, we can watch the news this month because I think Richard's, they're going to decide this month if he can speak or not. Um, but already the fact that they're saying we have to, we heard from the chancellor that they have to, when they didn't have a problem canceling on you know, one of the greatest living novelists, says to me something's going on in the way that these terms are applied. Another story that happened recently that's kind of got some connections to other stories, there was a situation called Gamergate that you, somebody, if you're writing papers, you might want to write a paper on this. It was a really important situation that introduced some of these changes. In Ga Gamergate basically happened, there was a, several women, um, most notably uh, Anita Sarkeesian here, who are scholars, they do cultural studies um, work, they do stuff sort of like what we talk about in some of our classes here, and they're particularly talking about gender in video games. And Anita Sarkeesian does this really cool work, you can watch some of her videos, where she's just breaking it down. If you look at video games, what kind of ideas do you get about what women are like and what men are like, right? What kind of ideas do you get about masculinity, femininity, if you spend a lot of time playing video games? She likes video games, she plays different ones, some games are better than others, but she kind of just looks at that. And what happened was there was this uproar from a lot of kind of sexist dudes um, who take video games really personally, who were like, who's she to say that? Like, I don't want to hear her talk, whatever. And they got organized and they started making death threats to her <coughs> to the extent that she was supposed to do a cross-country tour of college campuses talking about her research and all these different places, the college was like, yeah, I guess you have all these bomb threats. Good luck, there's not really anything we can do to protect you. And she had to cancel her whole tour. So where was her freedom of speech in this situation? Now, this gets crazy, Hold, stay with me here. The person most responsible for organizing those death threats and bomb threats and attacks on her was this person, Milo Yiannopoulos. By the way, if you see this with the sort of pinched fingers, this is a current sign meaning white power. This is not just A-OK. -okay. So Milo Yiannopoulos is a complex character. We could talk about him for an hour. <laughs> but um, he, was, he was the person who really organized these attacks on her. Milo then went on a national tour of college campuses. And in his talks, he said things, again, prepare for upsetting material. He said things like Islam is cancer. He said feminism is cancer. He said, you know, slavery was a good idea. He said that trans people are mentally ill and should have like lobotomies. Really, really violent, really threatening language, right? And yet at all these different campuses, the, the colleges were saying, well, we have to let him talk. He's got freedom of speech. We can't tell him no. He came to the University of Washington. Some of us were there. And um, some, a lot of the colleges where he went, there were big protests to shut him down. And some succeeded, like Berkeley, succeeded in stopping him from speaking. And that was a big national turmoil, right? University of Washington did not um, stop him from speaking. There were a bunch of skirmishes. There were fights. And somebody even got shot. One of the protesters trying to um, stop him from speaking, or at least calm people down, was shot by one of Milo's supporters. And yet, still, we hear him talked about, oh, you know, it's important to give him his freedom of speech, even if we, doesn't, we don't know what he like, what, we don't like what he has to say. Part of the backstory here, um, you might have noticed the, I've referred to it, the chancellor of University of Michigan said, you know, it's not a good idea in our current legal environment in this country as well as the Constitution, et cetera. I think what he might be referring to is there's a billionaire guy, Robert Mercer. He's a good name to look up. He was one of the main people who sort of was funding the um, Donald Trump campaign. Um, he's, a he's a really big funder of, of kind of far right causes. And he admits that he was basically funding the Milo Yiannopoulos tour and several of these other ones and then suing schools <coughs> that said no. So I think when the chancellor is like, it's not a good idea in this current legal environment, they might be talking about this fear of right-wing lawsuits, which is scary, but I don't think it's something that we should just give into. Another situation about the sort of inconsistency, here's another uh, sort of friend of mine. He's in Philadelphia at Drexel University, George um, Sicarilla Mayer. And he, he's got a fierce wit, um, and he started writing a lot. He writes a lot, and he started writing a lot about how messed up some of these people, like Richard Spencer, some of these right-wing people were, and he sort of was putting out some tweets that made fun of them. And they got really angry, and they started making death threats and bomb threats at him um, until he couldn't actually teach his classes anymore. He had to start teaching by Skype. And again, the university, they had, you know, they like had some bodyguards walk into class a couple times, and then said, they said, you know, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. So he had to teach from home for about a year, and then this last month, he 
he just retired. He just quit. He had a, a protected job, but because the university said, I'm sorry, we can't let some, you teach your classes because the students could get shot or you could, you get shot, we don't want to be responsible. He basically was pressured into, into quitting. Where was his freedom of speech? This remarkable author, um, Kianga Yamata Taylor, she wrote this book called Black, From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation. She's probably the best writer about, together with Ta-Nehisi Coates, about, about Black Lives Matter and the current moment. Um, she's at Princeton University, one of the most prestigious in the country, um, in the African American Studies Department, and just is a phenomenal speaker. I've seen her speak a couple times. She tried to come to Town Hall in Seattle. I don't know how many have gone to Town Hall. It's a really great place to see public events. Um, she tried to do an event at Town Hall earlier this year and had all these death threats and bomb threats in the city. The same city, you know, well, yeah, the city provided all of, um, that the, had all these police to provide to protect Milo Yiannopoulos when he spoke at University of Washington. The same city said, you know what, I'm sorry, we can't really protect you. I'm, you know, if you do this event, it's at your own risk. And so she canceled her event in Seattle because she said she feared for her life. She has a really powerful statement you might, you might want to look up. Again, I'll say it, where was her freedom of speech? So there's just a stark inconsistency, oh yeah, in the way these things are applied. I'm gonna bring up one more story. We're gonna come back to this one later because it's kind of an interesting story for several reasons. Um, but this uh, Palestinian professor, Stephen Salada, he's actually an expert about Native American studies. His scholarship and most of his books are about Native American history and settler colonialism in the United States. But he's also Palestinian himself and last time that Israel started bombing, saturation bombing Gaza in 2014, um, he was angry and wrote some angry tweets. All of his tweets were only criticizing state policy. He wasn't saying anything about any people, any individuals. He was saying the, the things that the state is doing are unforgivable, right? And for that, he was about to get a, he just quit, he just landed a job at University of Illinois. He quit his previous job, he was moving to Illinois, he'd already signed the contract, and he was notified that he was like unhired. Um, there were protests, especially at that college, around the country, people said this is outrageous, they didn't even give him a reason, although finally they came out and they said it was because of these tweets, and despite all of these protests, even a lot of, this was actually kind of play profile, a lot of people wrote letters and everything, but he did not get his job back. Where was his freedom of speech? So the inconsistency is a really serious thing. I think we can all see something's going on where some people get to claim freedom of speech and some people don't. And we can notice you know, that all the examples that we've heard of are these sort of right wing um, white guys. And the people who were most hit by this that we're seeing the examples often are people of color, women of color, queer folks. Um, Another aspect of this, it's connected, but it's a different focus, is that you know, a lot of the time when people are talking about freedom of speech, they're confusing it with something that I would call platforms. So for example, it's, a, it's an honor for me to be invited to speak to you today. And it's not, it's not just, you know, somebody can't say, I have something important to say, you know, give me a room with 300 people and a microphone and call everybody to see it, right? That takes a lot of work. And you only do that if somebody's sort of I don't want to say this about myself, but if somebody sort of earned being listened to, that's when they get invited, right? And it's if they reflect the values of the institution that's inviting them. So for example, here, I have Seattle Town Hall and this is Angela Davis speaking. Angela Davis is speaking there because she's had a lifetime of work, she has a lot of stuff to say, and these people want to hear it, right? So, but that's, there's, no, there's nothing in the First Amendment that says if somebody wants to talk to a big room full of people that you have to listen to them. <laughs> That's ridiculous, it doesn't make any sense, right? There's limited resources, whether it's a college campus in a public event or radio station or a published book or whatever, saying you don't wanna bother letting somebody say something that is not worth saying, that's not censorship. You're just not doing work to give them a platform. So I find this a very helpful term when you're hearing these people say, but free speech though, but free speech though. Don't confuse free speech with platforms because platforms are not a right. Um, 
Another example of this happening, I'm using the technical term bullshit here, so I hope nobody's offended. Um, recently at the University of Vermont, a, I think it was a professor actually, invited this guy Charles Murray to come give a talk. And Charles Murray is most famous for this book he wrote, I think in the 80s, maybe the 90s, called The Bell Curve, that claims that white people are biologically more intelligent than people of color. Right? And immediately after this book came out, I mean, within, within weeks after this book came out, every journal and the, all these things were coming out saying this is totally fake. He has absolutely horrible science. There's no, he has no evidence at all. It's just pure racism. And scientifically, it's absolutely debunked, right? And that was like 30, 20, 30 years ago that this was shown to be totally <laughs> bunk. But for some reason, um, the University of Vermont felt like they had to accept him as a speaker. So students took him on themselves. And I think that it's a really admirable decision to not give him a platform. He's totally discredited. Like his, the things that he's talking about have been shown time and again to have no value scientifically, socially, anything, right? So why let him speak? Um, so these students interfered with the event. Notice they all turned his back on him, which I think was kind of nice. And they had signs about him. And they made noise to disrupt his event. Now, do you think they got thanked? Do you think like the US public was like, thank you for saving our ears from stuff that we know is damaging and actually not true at all? No. The Washington Post, you know, supposedly like the one of the most liberal papers in the country, newspaper of record, within that week had two articles about it. One said that Middlebury's violent response to having him speak reminded somebody of the Little Rock Nine. And I got to unpack that, <laughs> exactly, I got to unpack that a bit. That's saying that the, black, the first black students to go to a previously segregated high school were like the professor. And the students who were trying to stop him from speaking were like the white supremacists who were trying to keep out the black students. What? And the same week we hear another opinion piece in the Washington Post that said protesters at the Middlebury College demonstrate cultural appropriation of fascism. I'm not sure what that means, but it's basically saying that they're fascists for not giving this guy a platform. I hate to say it, I didn't put it in the slideshow because it was too sad, but Cornell West came out and he agreed with that. He's like, yeah, these protesters, we have to value free speech. You're like, Cornell West? Yeah, that's how I feel, what? So my response to these, okay, so sorry, my response to this is that basically, I'm gonna come back to this in a minute, but. Some ideas aren't worth, some things aren't worth talking about anymore, right? Some ideas are, you can say, oh yeah, no, this isn't worth talking about anymore, how white people are biologically more intelligent because a hundred odd years ago, like thoroughly over and over, that was like disproven as a, as a thin excuse for robbing people of their lives, right? That's not science. That's not a good idea that maybe we should discuss. Um, so on one hand, you know, we hear a lot of people questioning the so-called experts or whatever, it's good to like question authority, it's good to ask questions, but at a certain point you're like, wait, I'm pretty sure that actually that's not true and it's sketchy to try to talk about that, you know, to raise these as if it's not settled. For example, um, Holocaust denialism, right? For example, the idea that maybe World War II did not involve Nazi Germany um, putting six million Jews plus to their death in, you know, in a variety of horrifying manners. This is a picture of Auschwitz. We now generally recognize that, I mean, there's, it's absolutely proven that this happened, right? And to question this, to say, well, but really though, is, is questioning this massive suffering, this every scientific reason to know that this happened and to question if it happened and maybe distrust the science, it's also to question that suffering. We think, we know as we should know that it's a closed question and it's, it's, it's sketchy it's wrong to bring it up like it might not be, right? So I think what people like Murray are doing and Richard Spencer and all these people is they're trying to do the same thing with 19th century like racial science. Um, back in the day when you know, people would say, well, if you measure somebody's head, you can find out their natural race and their ability. First of all, we know race exists in a very real way as a social phenomenon, right? We get treated very differently depending on what, ra what race we're read on. That's very real. 
race does not exist biologically in any way. Skin tone, hair texture, you know, these like eye shape, mouth shape, these things that don't have anything to do with each other and certainly don't have anything to do with like ability or intelligence. We have a history of those being used as excuses to rob people of their lives, right? But we know that those excuses aren't true. That's not like an interesting question to ask. So this is, to me, this is like Holocaust, it's like the Holocaust, like to, to, to act like maybe these are questions worth asking is sort of maybe is like asking if maybe the Holocaust was not all we thought it was or something. This is more of the images from back when it seemed like people had these interesting scientific questions about race, which were really just an excuse for the inequality that had produced that, you know, that the society had with no scientific basis, right? So when these people are talking about these supposed, you know, interesting ideas of inquiry and Richard Spencer is using his polite language, we should hear it for what it is, which is basically saying we should go back to a time when our institutions were not diverse, when, you know, we didn't even pretend to have legal equality for people and when we had basically institutionalized apartheid in this country. That's what they're saying is to go back to that with these excuses of things. I don't know why we would make space for that. A couple other related points. I wrote this piece recently for the Federal Way Mirror, and I made the point in this that the only content in what they're saying, if you look at it, is that other people shouldn't be allowed to speak, right? So if the only content in the interesting ideas of Richard Spencer or Milo Yiannopoulos is because of somebody's sexuality or because somebody's race, that maybe they're not full human beings, maybe we shouldn't listen to, them, you know, maybe they shouldn't have a, a spot in the public. What that's actually doing is taking away speech from a huge number of people. And so that's why I'm saying it's actually the opposite of free speech, no matter how much they like to tell us that they're, they're practicing free speech, right? And that's how we should treat it, is the opposite of free speech. Um, philosopher Karl Popper talked about the paradox of tolerance. And he said, um, there's a, it's kind of a contradiction because you want to have a society that's tolerant and allows all sorts of people. But if there's people who come up in that that don't believe in allowing all sorts of people, if you have intolerant people in your tolerant society, what do you do with them? It's a problem, right? And you can basically, if you allow, if you tolerate intolerance, then as we saw in Nazi Germany, Karl Popper said, it'll put an end to your tolerant society. Those people found a loophole and they can make it an intolerant society. So the solution to it is you actually have to be intolerant to intolerance <laughs> if you're gonna stay tolerant. Okay. What? That was a lot of words. TLDR. I'm going to show a video that just came out yesterday by this woman, Molly Stewart, that basically says maybe everything I just said in a lot cuter images. So I'm just going to play this. So my baby brother is convinced that he has the right to free speech. And I'm like, sure, you can cry all you want, but I shouldn't have to listen to it. Hey, you know what? That's just like what's going on with the fault right. If Richard Suspenders is at a dinner party with a bunch of dinosaurs crying about how white power isn't the same as it was in the olden days, I'm like, la di da I'm making pancakes, don't care. <laughs> but if he's on TV with a bunch of people cheering and doing weird Nazi gestures, then I'm like, Mom, why does this scary man get to tell people they aren't really humans and no one listens to me even when I have super genius ideas? She says it's because I'm not a white man funded by right-wing billionaires. So I guess, like, even though everyone has the right to speak, money makes some people way louder. But what I don't get is that my baby brother isn't being paid by billionaires, and he's so loud. Anyways, I have a plan. I'm going to march around the house with my accordion. <laughs> Hey, old man, my mom made my dad take my accordion away. She said if I try to silence him, I'll only make him louder, but I'm not silencing him. I'm just drowning him out so we don't all go crazy. What's this university that brings in the police to keep the protesters away? This is so unfair. Now I feel like crying. 
So I close my eyes and try to remember what my teachers taught me about the First Amendment. A long time ago, there was a group called the Wobblies, who wobbled around for many years, protesting places that didn't let people speak freely. When police came to take them away, they were too wobbly to be arrested, so they were sprayed with fire hoses instead. But they kept right on saying that workers shouldn't be starving and stuff like that. <coughs> then later, I can't remember when, there was a student at UB Berkeley who was handing out papers and got arrested for it. But his friends saw them put him in the car and said, Oh no you don't, and climbed on top like it was a jungle gym. They stayed there for 30 hours. Now students can give out papers without getting into big trouble. Oh, and then there's my most favoriteest free speecher ever, Colin. Mr. Kaepernick kneels on the football field because the national anthem has a white people rhythm, and he's like, could we get a little jazz in here? <laughs> Unlike my brother or the crazy rich white guys, Mr. Kaepernick doesn't have his free speech protected. And now I don't get to see him on television anymore. All I see on television are the really terrible things that people do after they listen to the fault right guys. <laughs> I should just play the video over and over. So, um, super beautiful. So, I'm going to end kind of quickly with an overview um, of some of the way, some of our accordions, some of the tools that we have in a few different ways to oppose these kind of um, this kind of language, these kind of speakers, you know, these kind of events in our community. Um, I'm going to race through them because I underestimated my time, as always overestimated. So uh, first of all, there's a list of legal responses. Also, we have half an hour for Q&A after this, so um, any of these that you want to find out more about, we can go more in depth in. Um, so for example, I just wanted to say, you know, Highline is really in a particular position with this stuff. We haven't really had any of these problems yet, and hopefully we won't be faced with them. But because we're the most diverse college in the state, um, you know, if this stuff kind of comes near our campus, it might be particularly difficult. I, I'm so happy about we have, you know, our culturally diverse, diverse, cultural diversity policy. We say Highland College actively promotes and supports an environment, uh, learning and work environment, um, which ensures social justice, mutual respect, understanding, civility, and nonviolence, and is opposed to discrimination. So just to, for all of us in our different positions to think about what it means to actively promote and support that kind of environment, if we're faced with this kind of challenge, it might be complicated, right? And so far, the Attorney General of Washington has taken a very passive role and sort of gone together with this like, well, whatever you know, these people say is probably freedom of speech. And I mean, we might need to kind of be prepared for situations and deal with those contradictions ahead of time. Um, I think Highline has been really a leader in this already and is really ahead of the curve, but it's a problem that I don't think anybody has the answer to yet, so we need to be preemptive and really think about those solutions. I think in some ways we are, and it's something also that we should all be working on. 
Um, I wanted to say hate speech is, you know, it's in the title of this talk, but actually I don't find it the most useful term because it's legally really ambiguous. It doesn't necessarily, it can be really hard to apply because you have to show somebody's motives. And also a lot of the time, hate speech or hate crime modifications are actually applied against sort of the wrong people. They're a lot of the time applied against people protesting you know, racism or against these things. They're kind of ambiguous. And part of that is because I'm not sure hate is actually the issue, right? So for example, here's another content warning. I'm gonna show a couple nasty flyers in, a, in just a second. Here's a couple, um, here's a flyer from uh, one of these sort of neo-Nazi groups. And here's the 14 words as a sort of the white nationalist motto right now. And notice the 14 words they say that we have to secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. Where's the hate? They're just, it's all about the children, right? I don't think we should fall for that. But notice they're being really careful to not sound like they hate anybody. They're just, we just care about our children, right? And here, this flyer from this nasty traditional worker party, love your people. And so we know this is coded as racism. This is coded, I mean, sure, it's hateful, but it's kind of, hate's the thing that's hard to point out. However, racism is pretty clear, right? So if we acknowledge that racism is the problem, you know, homophobia, bigotry, then we can have a critique towards it. If we're looking for the hate, you know, they might say, oh no, it's just about love. It's a little, it's, it's not the clearest standard. <sighs> um, so I'm gonna blow through these, and if you wanna hear about any particular one of these, I'm happy to revisit it in the Q&A. Um, there's a thing that is effective called real threat, where if there's a situation, given the context, if a reasonable person feels like, knows that they're being threatened, then that's not protected speech. So I think, for example, the College Republicans, the group that brought Milo to the UW campus, the day after there was that shooting, they, they released a statement and they're like, activists, labor people, leftists, gay people, whatever, there's like this list, they're like, we are coming after you, we will put out your flame. After, like a day after a shooting, the, by somebody associated with the group, that's a context that makes that a real threat. So that's not protected speech. Um, Milo targeted a trans student at a previous event and the student had to drop out of college because so many people were, were threatening that person. That was a real threat, that's not protected speech. Um, if somebody's getting rid, getting in the way of what a college is there for, the material, materially disrupting the purpose of a college, that's not protected. Um, and that can be something that's, that's limited. Harassment, even if you're talking, even if somebody's talking when they harass somebody, it's not freedom of speech, it's harassment, it's not protected speech. Um, this pops up on campuses all the time. I would claim that that UW theater thing where people were inside and these threatening like death threats were pasted on it was not freedom of speech as the UW has written house, I think is the guy's name, said that was not definitely not protected speech. It was actually prosecutable. Another terrible example I want to throw at you. So again, this is maybe the worst yet. Um, this is a very transphobic and homophobic flyer we're about to see. This happened two months ago. Oh, it's so awful. I'm sorry to show you this, but it's a really clear example of this, what we're talking about. Um, this group at the, the Cleveland State University posted this flyer encouraging queer students to kill themselves because a very large number of youth suicides, oh, so ugly. <clears throat> a very large number of youth suicides are, are queer folks, right? So this flyer is saying, do it, join your fellow, you know, F word. And it's signed fascist solutions. That's the group that put it up. And what's the response from the administration? of Cleveland State University. They said, you know, of course, just like the other guy, of course we believe in diversity, we're proud of, the, proud of our diversity. And then in their official letter they said, CSU is also committed to uphold the First Amendment, even with regard to controversial issues where opinion is divided. That was their response to this flyer. <laughs> so I would argue rather, <laughs> aggressively that that is not indeed First Amendment and it's not a divided issue, right? It's extreme harassment. It's a, you know, I, I can't believe they would say that. And then finally, incitement to violence is another thing. Legally, it's not protected speech. Activists like on the left get, go to jail for this stuff all the time. I know environmental activists who because they talked about planning or you know, they talked about how companies should 
pay the cost if they're doing environmental damage or hurting animals, some people I know, with animal rights. Just for saying that on tape, they got years in prison. They weren't threatening any people at all, but because it was incitement to violence, um, they, were, they were found guilty and conspiracy and all these things and put away. And then we have people advocating genocide and they get to claim free speech? I don't think so. So we're out of time. Um, I, I do feel like it depends a lot. Responses to these kind of things um, depends a lot on the context. Um, it's different if you see it in a classroom. I think sometimes classrooms, if you've built, uh, if you have a supportive environment where people have some relationship with each other, it can sustain people kind of trying to figure these things out a bit more. I had a class recently where um, an international student had sort of caught a hold of the of the build a wall rhetoric and they kind of were presenting this thing about how we should build a wall because all these illegal immigrants are making problems. And I know that there were undocumented students in that class, but because we had a relationship built up in the context of a classroom, those students were like, are you sure about that one part where you said that that's because of you know, undocumented immigrants? Where was your source for that? And they were able to get the student to reconsider the way they thought about stuff in a conversation. A classroom is different than a public space. And I think you wouldn't want that conversation if it was gonna really upset or shut down conversation with other students. But like that classroom, people knew each other enough, had enough trust that they could kinda have that conversation and show that person maybe what they were missing. So classroom, it just depends, you know, I think building a classroom where you can support everybody and if it's strong enough maybe you can actually kind of work through that and show people ways of thinking that can work it depends um, and then finally campus response um, I feel strongly that you know this stuff it's not going away we're gonna have to deal with it in some form and the best way to deal with it is for everybody we should all be thinking you know as students as faculty as administrators as staff what are our accordions? And also outside of campus, right? Like as citizens, as people who live in a certain area, as parts of communities, what are our accordions? What's going on around us? And what kind of ways can we, can we stop them and fight back? Thank you. So at this point, if you have any questions, go ahead and raise your hand and Michaela's gonna walk around with the mic and go ahead and provide them for you. Hello, Dr. Sean. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question. Like, uh, we know we came from uh, our ancestor was back and they, they, they were fighting like, against each other, like uh, on the race, on everything, like uh, black versus white versus brown, all these things. And in the past, we had a, we have we have a very darkness, and right now we are a little bit good. So still, we have some issues. How long do you think it will take us, how many generations it will take to this issue, like a racism, like a freedom of speech will go, go, go away? Um, I don't know, but that's a great question. I think um, this is actually a little bit, I have an answer for you that's a little bit distant from this, but I, I, wrote, I wrote two books. I wrote my first book about former Yugoslavia um, and the war that happened there. And what I was struck by in that and kind of why I decided to write a book about it was um, so people outside that situation, like people in the US were saying, oh, you know, they've been killing each other forever because like religion and stuff. And that's actually not true at all. Before the 20th century, um, people like the people in that area weren't, people would invade it, but people in the area weren't ever really killing each other on any kind of big scale or whatever. It was more like outsiders versus locals. Um, and a couple of their, you know, World War I, World War II hit there very hard, and then the 90s had terrible civil wars there. But when I talked to people and researched it, what was actually clear was when people were in, the, in a really bad situation, and they were competing for just like safety, and they were convinced like, it's your family or, or them, that's your choice, then people understandably, it's tragic, but understandably people chose to protect themselves. Some people did, some people didn't, but a lot of people chose to do violence against others. Wouldn't that seem like the situation? And then, for example, 
when World War II ended, after massive violence, massive, it, World War II um, hit that area the hardest in all of Europe. Within a generation, like one out of three marriages was across ethnic lines. So given a chance to like get past it, given a chance to actually live like a, a decent <laughs> life and not have to take stuff out on each other, people generally are pretty anxious to get that chance. So I have this weird idea that <laughs> nobody you know, that is different from how we think about this a lot of the time, that actually people can change really fast if the situation changes really fast, right? And I think what we're seeing in this country right now is that um, a lot of the people who were, you know, doing these kind of policies and feeling this kind of way, they think they're in a corner, maybe in a way that they're not. And I think as soon as people get that their interests aren't opposed, um, I mean, a lot, yeah, as soon as people don't see their interests as opposed, but they see, like, that there's a system kind of, like, outside of them, if they see this setup and they see that they have a reason to get along, the problem, the, that situation can change really fast, right? Or apartheid South Africa, it seems it would never end. It would never end. And then there was this really am amazing movement. People rose up and, I mean, it took some decades. But really, you saw it happen on the surface really quickly. And suddenly you have, you know, what, I don't know, what was a century of, like, apartheid overturned and a totally different system. And then that ended up having problems, too. But this thing that seems timeless seemed like it was just how people were, like went away like that. So I think it can change. The good news is I think it can change for the better really fast. The bad news is I think it ch can change for the worse really fast also. <laughs> and I think this last year, a lot of us have been a little bit winded by how fast a lot of things changed for the worse that we didn't, we didn't see coming. So I think, I think people are, the reason we've survived and adapted and evolved for as long as we have is because we can change. We're really good at doing stuff in a new way. That can be used for better or for worse. Um, I had a question about freedom of speech. You've talked a lot about what isn't freedom of speech, but what do you think really constitutes freedom of speech? And um, <laughs> And like, why they wrote it into the Constitution? What do you think their intentions were when they were writing the Constitution about? So one thing is, I don't. This never actually happened in my life, but I always imagine if I'm having a fight with somebody and they're like, "Well, you have to give me freedom of speech," I'd be like, "I'm not Congress, <laughs> right?" Because freedom of speech says Congress will not pass a law that abridges. And if I'm telling somebody, "Shut up," like we don't want to hear that here. That's not about Congress. I can say that. It's fine. <laughs> Arguably, if I'm a teacher at the moment or something, it's a little confusing, but um, I would never. But anyway, um, so I think what, what I'm saying here is clearly when they made that law, they were talking about the whole Bill of Rights and the whole idea of the sort of liberal uh, 18th century bourgeois system of government was coming out of monarchy. They were like... We don't want a system where you can have some dude that just says what happens. We want something where, you know, that respects individual rights. And you have, you know, legal recourse. You have a system set up to make sure that that happens, right? Um, the world was a really different place back then, and we found that a lot of those limitations weren't adequate. But it's a nice, um, you know, it's a nice idea. And I think the reason I posted this is I think clearly the point of the Bill of Rights and the point of the, const of the constitutional rights that we do have that I think we should fight for and hold on to um, is, is, you know, does anybody know the difference between, has anybody heard the terms punching down and punching up? I love these. They're, again, when I hear a lot of this conversation, I come back and I think, who's, are you punching up or down? Punching down is when there's somebody who's like weaker than you, who has less power, who you can, it's, be, it's like being a bully. It's some, somebody that you can get away with picking on. That's punching down. Or making, it's like making fun of somebody who has less power than you. It's a cheap shot, you know? So I think basically given the centuries of inequality in this country, all the people that we're talking about here, Richard Spencer and Milo, they're all punching down. They're bullies is basically what they are, right? And they're, they're supporting a, a systemic bullying system called racism that's dispossess people of their lives and their wealth. The difference between that and this, which is a famous image from Black Lives Matter, is clearly 
this woman, she's very powerful in a sense, but in another sense, she's punching up. She's not bullying these police. That doesn't make sense because they have like, they're like stormtroopers in Star Wars, right? They have all this special gear and everything, and they have the law behind them. They have a lot of history. They have all sorts of power, and she's not having it. She's like, nope, nope, I'm gonna stay in the street. I don't, this is my, I don't even care what you think about the issue, right? I'm gonna stay right here. Um, so that's punching up because at least structurally, they have so much more power than she does, and so she's fighting against where the power is. And I think that's what the Bill of Rights was meant for, right? It's, it was passed, they're thinking about kings. They're not thinking about, um, you know, small time bullies on each other or whatever. They're thinking about limitation on the powers of government. So, you know, do I think that, I'm, I'm obviously critical of how freedom of speech is being used in this. Do I think that, like, people who have terrible racist things to say should be shut down by police? I mean, I don't know, I guess not. I wish the police would stop shutting people down who had good stuff to say, <laughs> like this, right? So, I, you know, I think the thing is like, essentially it's meant to protect people from punching up. Essentially, the Bill of Rights, including the, freedoms, including the First Amendment, is meant to put, the, put a check on the government. But we're seeing those things twisted to a very, very different meaning. We're seeing them applied to sort of punching down. Um, so how should we use the term freedom of speech if it's not being used equally? That's a great question. I don't know if I have an answer. I think I, I, I just point out that it's not being used equally. So if somebody's like, well, why don't I have a freedom of, I'm like, well, because a lot of other people don't. So if you're serious about it, why don't you let those people talk? You know, I think it's just pointing out that it doesn't mean what people pretend it does. Um, sometimes I think, so I teach rhetoric classes here, and I wrote my last book about nonviolence, and I didn't even say anything about what I think of like nonviolence as an idea. I just point out how people use the word. So I think maybe it's similar here. I think it's good for us to point out how people are using the word freedom of speech. And then, if you can get them to acknowledge that, and you can acknowledge the problems, then maybe you could start a conversation, what should it mean, you know? But if these people, I don't know, I don't think it makes sense as a reason or not. What I'm saying is these people are like, you can't shut me down. You have to let me talk because freedom of speech. I'm like, no, I don't. Because that's not the standard that's being applied to other people who deserve it way more. A uh, couple questions. Uh, earlier you were talking about uh, the University of Washington allowing, I believe it was uh, Milo and the city's response with resources. Uh, are you, is there an insinuation that they're allowing right, more right behavior than left? Absolutely. Uh, I, I think the evidence is on the table. Um, why wasn't that police, if they're gonna have a police force for Milo, why would they have it for um, Yamato Kiyomu Taylor? And also, why would they have one for Milo? <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, there's different ways to talk about this stuff. If you want really, like, my take why that's happening, I think it's that Robert Mercer lawsuit. And I think that the um, chancellor early on, who's like, given the legal environment in this country right now, we have to respect Richard Spencer's freedom of speech. I think what he's saying is, given that we're terrified of a lawsuit by this billionaire who's looking to sue us for this. And for better or worse, I don't think that there's, there's any billionaire like people who are gonna sue on behalf of George Cipriano Meyer or Yamata Kimber Taylor or Steven Slater. So yeah, I think it's absolutely inconsistent. The real reason I think is, just to break it down for you guys and not leave you a mystery, I really think the reason, and I kind of hear this from people who or in some of those meetings is the is the lawsuit that's pending, and Robert Mercer is pretty openly uh, he's pretty open in the in the press that he's been he's concerned about. I have a quote here actually. Um, he's concerned about the <coughs> limitations of freedom of speech of conservative students, and he's active on campuses to enforce that. Something like that. So yeah, I think they they basically are saying that that's what's going on, and I think it's on us. 
It's one of these things, um, you know, I don't think these administrators could just go ahead and switch things or they're going to get sued. They have to have, have a movement behind them that gives them that power, and that's us, right? So I think it's because people don't know what to do around these words freedom of speech, and there's not like so many people mobilizing that they can get away with it. And then administrators are sort of like, I don't like, you're going to put me in this position? So yeah, I think um, it's on us to make sure that our institutions reflect those values and not just look up to people who's, it's just their job. We have to create an environment where people recognize that, you know, these people aren't exercising the free speech there. I guess like the last part of like, uh, question would be, you know, when I think of Seattle, University of Washington, very liberal city, a very liberal college, are we that far behind that even they are allowing, uh, like Milo to speak? Yeah. I'm asking, is that, are we that far behind that even Seattle? So this is tricky because this is, this, this is deep. Um, the Pacific Northwest is a strange region. And it's got a really extreme, you know the, they talked about the Wobblies, that labor group that was doing free speech fights? There were, some of the most prominent murders of Wobbly leaders were in Centralia and in Everett, both high profile stories at the time. Um, and you know, the Klan has been very active in the Northwest. Oregon had it in the law books, it said something like 2002 that no black folks should live there, right? So it's a weird place because I think, I don't know, for various reasons, Grunge and Microsoft or whatever, Starbucks, so if you drink coffee, you have to be. We have this like liberal self-image, we vote for gay marriage and pod or whatever, right? So there's ways that that's true, and there's ways, especially around race, that is really not true. Numbers show that King County, if you measure by, in a certain way, by wealth and race within zip codes, so you have to measure that certain way. King County is the most economically segregated county in the country. <laughs> right? So it depends, you know, the attitudes aren't, you don't hear people talk here necessarily in the same way as Alabama or something, but the but you know, where the money's at and where it goes, South King County has a higher murder rate than Haiti does, right? There's some serious, serious inequality here. And we have yet to do deal with that. And I think there's a weird thing, I'm going to get a bit personal around this shooting, and Milo, that was my friend who was shot. I mean, he lived, but he got injured. Um, trying to have conversations about this, I think sometimes that liberal self-image really gets in the way. So one thing I saw when I was trying to talk to, to folks, and I, you know, just in the, in the city or whatever, about the thing that happened at that event, at the Milo protest, and the, you know, my friend getting shot, People would kind of be like, oh, no, that wouldn't happen. That wouldn't happen here. And I'm like, no, I mean, I was there. Like, I, I, I was right there when this guy got shot. And, I, and you can read it in the newspaper, like, it happened. And people would be like, no, 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 that, it wouldn't happen here because we're like a little city. So sometimes, even, I'll tell you, there was a, anyway, yeah, I'll just say that. The, the sort of, it would never happen here when it's actually happening right in front of you is this problem that we have because of that, that image. And I think the Northwest, um, it's a little more confusing than a lot of parts of the country because it's got, it's very liberal in certain ways. And I think it's also never dealt with race. It's worse about race than a lot of parts of the country too. So it's, it's hard, yeah. So I wanted to bounce off of what, what Milo said about like the gentleman over there asked. I feel like when we think about race in the context of American history, well, it came from blue brown people people of higher power, and there, as you can see, there's a lot of force put behind racism and teaching people these, uh, these, these certain kind of rhetoric. But when we look at trying to alleviate the problems, no one talks about them. Mm. So do you think there should be laws implemented by the government to enforce teaching tolerance and diversity in schools, like elementary, to try to alleviate the problem? Because we talk about the issues, but no one, a lot of people are miseducated about race what's actually going on in America. Like a lot of us, we don't know what's actually happening. And I feel like there's not enough, the government's not taking enough responsibility since a lot of the problems they've created to try to alleviate the problems, maybe with education 
or any other <coughs> ways and means of trying to fix the issue? Really powerfully put. Um, I mean, I got mixed feelings about that. Uh, I think there's sometimes that programs like that can be great. I mean, I think it's really great the programs, the programs we have like that here, for example, can be really helpful. But across the board, you know, before I would advocate as that as a major thing, I would like to see the government. I mean, the government. I don't like to say the government. It's like saying the media or society it has so many different parts and contradictions. But we have a lot of laws on the books and a lot of things that are done legally that are still really actively promoting structural racism. So I'd like to see those things change first before we focus on education. I mean, on you know government wide showing people about diversity or whatever. In educational institutions, that's what we're here for, right? So yes, here absolutely. But do I think that's the main solution? I mean, we've seen with Black Lives Matter that there's things immediately where accountability and accountability and the structure of a lot of officials, the fact that in the United States, if an officer commits, um, even is you know, found guilty of committing an, uh, like a unforgivable um, infraction, a murder of somebody where there's no excuse or something, by law, like they're not, they don't get in trouble. It's the department that pays a fine. That's a that's a structural problem in every police department. That's also not individual officers' fault. That's 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 the way the laws are set up and the structure and the union, like the police unions, everything. There's this whole thing that's set up. I think changing that, like Black Lives Matter, has really raised awareness about changing things like that would maybe have a start having a real impact. So education is important. We're in a we're in an educational institution. You know, I'm a professor here. Like, it's really important. But that's not the only part. I think we need to change the parts that are actively still racist and promoting inequality. I wanted to, I don't remember if I can find the book. Um, you know, I, I can look for it afterwards. There's a book that just came out about government housing policies of the United States since World War II. And you know, it's not a coincidence that all the black folks were living in the city and that everybody is now like, you know, gets pushed south. That's policy. And, and banks that you know loan would loan money to certain neighborhoods to start businesses or fix up houses and redline and not loan money to other neighborhoods. That's policy. That's like that's like law, and that's still going on even the, even long after Jim Crow. So I'd like to see those things change. And if you change the material situation, then you know that's going to change the social racism that happens because of it. So I think, yeah, I mean, education's great, but there's a lot of other levels we need to look at, too. Um, relating to the laws and stuff, if we want to look up and research where, where would we go, how would we find out, like, which laws aren't, are racist or have racist tendencies to them, where do we go? So what I usually write about is social movements. And I think, um, here, I'll show you my favorite book on this stuff. Usually this is what I talk about. Um, there's a book that's like my Bible called Poor People's Movements, How They Succeed, Why They Fail, by Francis Fox Pitt. Um, probably have it in the bookstore here. And according to them, the way this stuff works is that, you know, if you have a cousin who's like got a billion dollars, if you'd like, you know, you're friends with Robert Mercer and you can call him up, then you have access to power, right? If you have somebody that's like a legislature, so you went to school with and you go to drinks with them, you have access to power. Most of us don't, right? And if you don't have access to that kind of power, if your only power is like a vote every four years or whatever, mm -hmm. then historically the way that people, poor people, marginalized people, have power is by disruption. It's by getting in the way of stuff. Getting in the way of stuff that makes everyday life happen. And um, making an issue of it. So what do we see with Black Lives Matter? Highway shutdowns, right? People are like, if you keep shooting us, we're not gonna let you drive to work, okay? <laughs> what do we see with the first week of the refugee ban, right? People are like, if you're not gonna let refugees like get off the plane and come home to their families, and you're gonna try to send them back to a country where they get killed, we're not gonna let you fly your planes, okay? <laughs> right? And Occupy was like, if you're gonna like foreclose all our houses, we're gonna not let you have like, your bus stop in the middle of the city. We're gonna turn it into our new home. So that's the trick. And I think social movements, when that's happening, that's like ears to the ground, and they come out with ideas, and they tell you what's up 
faster than any professor would, right? So I think, what have we been hearing from social movements recently? We said the immigration ban, right? We said Black Lives Matter is still going on. Um, so that's one place. People involved with those movements, people writing from them, people like um, Yamata um, Kamu Taylor that I mentioned, John Hayes, that's good. People involved with these movements who seem to know what they're talking about, they will point the way. And there's so many people who are like, oh yeah, like this will like that one. So that's why I recommend starting. Um, beyond that, like that, I mean, specifically, like that book, oh, I can see the cover, I can't remember, it's called like The Color, oh, you remember? The Color of Law. It's called The Color of Law, thank you! Woohoo! Okay, so. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. You have librarians in the room, <laughs> Yes, sorry, I forget. Um, if we don't have these books in the library right now, we will have them too. Okay. So, the answer to your question is go to the library and ask the librarian, because they know all these things. Um, this is a particular book that I've heard is really excellent that just came out, and Amazon just crashed, so. Uh oh. So, we'll see what no. that does to housing values. Do you see the little X down in the right hand corner? Oh, yeah, it opened the. There we go, this is a book. Thank you, Naomi. My brains are magic. There we go. So that's a book specifically that just came out about this. The New Jim Crow is the classic book about um, how this stuff worked around mass incarceration and the war on drugs by Michelle Alexander. That's an extremely important book. So I think those two would be really good to start. And then like I teach in my research classes, you can look at the bibliography of this one and see what they read and read those books. <laughs> So uh, everything you have talked about today is very important, but what is one takeaway thing from this presentation today? Um, no, I'm serious. I think you know, last year this time was extremely scary. Um, Thinking about that protest, where the guy where my friend got shot, being beat up, that was a really scary moment. And now looking back after a year, you know, I'm not sure things are quite as scary as they looked. I think there's things that are, I just read that, there's another book, good book that just came out called Fire and Fury. And this guy who's like lived in the White House this whole year. And everybody, I gotta tell you about this book. Yay, yeah, books. Um, everybody in the White House hates each other so much that they would just run to this guy and be like, you wouldn't believe what this idiot said today. And they just all talk trash on each other. And then he wrote it all down. And he, it's a book. And it's really enjoyable to read. And it also means that the, the sort of last year, it seemed like there was this master plan in place. It was really scary. And it was kind of true. And that's kind of falling apart. So now I think we're kind of in this like, what now moment, right? What now? I have no idea. But um, the same stuff that's worked in the past, you know, um, finding each other and thinking about where your accordions are at, like, you can never go wrong with that. Um, I do think we need to take really seriously, like, how scary stuff is. We're not making this up. This is, I'll say, like, I've been involved with protests and stuff for like 30 years, and there was so long where I'm like, oh, this is a good issue, okay, I'll go to that march, I'll go to that meeting, I'll talk to this person. But you know, it's not like the real, it's not like the real issue or whatever, it's like this thing that's important, but it's not the heart of the matter. Suddenly, like the last couple of years, like Occupy Black Lives Matter, the stuff that's coming up, that's the that's like the core of our problems. It's on the table now. It's never, it's never been on the table like it is right now. And then you have a reaction to that, where people are like, I don't want that on the table. Take that off the table. So the one takeaway point, maybe it's like, how about let's keep it on the table? Let's keep it on the table till we like deal with it. And you know, like sometimes that happens pretty quick. You could be surprised for good, like surprised for bad. But um, we'll see. One more question. Let me talk about. Um, were there any? I mean, anything's great, but.
Hey, all right, cool, boys. All right, so um, I see everything that uh, you're uh, discussing about, and it seems like what the bigger problem is, and the biggest problem is pretty much money. That's what it boils down to. So, um, how do people actually combat enterprises and individuals and corporations that fund this type of thinking? Because, yeah, we, you know, somebody mentioned about government and talk about education and things like that, but that's what it is. These uh, lobbyists have their hands in the pockets of these politicians, and they buy these. They buy this type of thinking. And so at the end of the day, yeah, it's great to have these discussions and things like that, but until we actually find ways to combat these powers that have deep, deep pockets, uh, as you know, you know, being a black man and seeing everything that is kind of like, it's overwhelming. And I just want to find ways to actually just have these types of discussions, but also try to find ways to actually divert the money into people that actually will make changes and actually will stand up against these corporations and these powers that that be. Absolutely, that's such a that's really great point to end on. I think I mean there's I think there's two directions to that. One is that you think. Yeah, like the money behind this all, right? We forget about that. And so, for example, since we're talking about racism, right? We forget that the reason racism got invented is to legitimize people getting enslaved and people getting robbed of their land. Those are the two founding acts of this country in some way, and racism was made to say that that's okay, right? So that's a money, essentially, underneath it all, slavery and colonialism, were these things that happened for money. And then afterwards, you have racism to be like, no, but it's okay, though, because they're not really human. Right? So in a way, the, we, we always kind of lose that tie between the money that's, that you know, is motivating stuff and then the social phenomenon that we see. And so we want to go back and remember that that's going on behind it, like you're saying. So that's a really good point. The other direction of that, though, this is kind of some Marxist metaphysics weirdness, is like, what's money except like a, a very powerful symbol of social power. Money is just a way of showing social power. So things that we value as a society get a lot of money, because that's what money means. So things that we decide as a society we don't value, we can start taking their money away. And I think one way, I told you about protests, one way that happens is when, like I said, that, or like that book says, poor people, marginalized people start interfering with that reproduction cycle, that hits the money pretty quick. This is MLK week, I'll end it with tying it back to what did MLK do, right? MLK talked about having a dream, MLK talked about reconciliation and talked a lot about love. He also talked a lot about power, and he also stopped the money. <laughs> he got in the way, he cost certain people a lot of money with boycotts, right? Especially with boycotts, with all sorts of like blockades, with stoppages, embarrass the business class of these cities until they're like, okay, we can't afford apartheid anymore. How about we ask this guy to a meeting and see what we can do next so we can start making our money again, right? That was a big part of what he did. And you read his stuff, he says this, right? He's like, this is part of his process, was economic direct action. So one side of it is to see the money behind society, the other side of it is to see society behind money, and that when we decide our values and we stand up for them, then ultimately the money just follows where that goes. It can take a lot of work, it can take bloodshed, and it's a struggle, but that's ultimately the money goes along with what we believe and stand up for. Everyone, please give it up.